Welcome back to the channel. Today I'm going to be discussing On Palestine, a conversation between Noam Chomsky and Ilan Pape, moderated by the editor Frank Barat. Now, this is not the first book that these three have worked together on. There's actually one before this called Gaza and Crisis, which I will review later this year. I just can't read all the books at once. It's a short, powerful read, just a couple hundred pages, with a beautiful cover design, obviously, of Kafia, Palestinian Kafia. Uh, I don't think I, obviously I've read Ilan Pape before. I haven't read Frank Barat and I think I've seen Noam Chomsky give a few speeches, but I don't think I've read any of his texts before. So that he was one of the big revelations to me in this text. And what I'll do is I'll start with um, Frank Barat. He sets the stage for some of the conversation. I'll proceed to Ilan Pape, who, because I've been watching more of, of his videos and, and learning more about his positions, I'm a bit more familiar with. And then I'll end with Chomsky, which who introduced some new ideas to me that, I, I really appreciate and are starting to help me evolve the way that I'm thinking. I'm not saying that Pape or Barat doesn't do that as well, but Chomsky really introduced some ideas that I hadn't thought about and is part of this learning process as we go through this this year. All right, so let's start with what Frank has to say. Insisting on describing what happened to the Palestinians in 1948 and ever since as a crime and not just as a tragedy or even a catastrophe is essential if past evils are to be rectified. The ethnic cleansing paradigm points clearly to a victim and offender, and more importantly, to a mechanism of reconciliation. So you have to keep in mind, obviously, the word Nakba means catastrophe, and that is it is true. It was a catastrophe, but more than a catastrophe, there was a crime committed. I mean, a catastrophe could be an earthquake. It could be a tornado, something natural, a tsunami. But this was something human. It was something perpetrated. And it needs to be seen that way because also... Crimes can be forgiven, they can be prosecuted, there can be healing, there can be a, a process forward. The desire to turn the mixed ethnic Palestine into a pure ethnic space was and is at the heart of the conflict that has raged since 1882. Don't think that's disputable. The international silence in the face of this crime against humanity, which is how ethnic cleansing is defined in the Dictionary of International Law, transform the ethnic cleansing into the ideological infrastructure on which the Jewish state was built. So he's pointing out, it's not just a crime against the Palestinians. In a sense, it's also a crime against any Jews who wish to build a state that isn't defined solely by ethnicity and that excludes everyone else. And that's something to, to consider as well. Something that you'll often, I'll see it in the comments, I'll, I'll hear it as, an, as what I call IDF talking point, is that Israel is a democracy in this region and it's a light. So Frank says, this charade is still marketed successfully in the West. Israel is a democracy because the majority decides what it wants, even if the majority is determined by means of colonization, ethnic cleansing, and recently by ghettoizing the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip, enclaving them in areas... A and B in the West Bank, he's referring to Oslo, if you don't know what those areas are, and in isolated villages in the greater Jerusalem area, the Jordan Valley, and the Bedouin reservations in the Nakab. And you won't often hear about the Bedouins. They, they have even less, let's say, profile than other Palestinians, but they are cruelly persecuted by the Israelis as well. So moving on to, to Elon. Now, what you have to realize is Pape... He's an activist, right? So he's, and, and this Benny Morris has beef with him about this because in Benny Morris's eyes, you know, historians are like priests. They're supposed to be objective. They're not supposed to have opinions, even though he has opinions. And so he, he, he attacks Elon on the idea that he's someone with a political ax to grind, as if a historian isn't allowed to be an activist, as if a historian isn't allowed to have opinions about things. And so interestingly, a book I'll be review, uh, reviewing in a few weeks called 1948, which is one of the definitive histories uh, of that war, the war that happened in that year, Morris comes to the same conclusions that that Pape does in terms of numbers of people that were, were kicked out and that it wasn't they were told to leave or they left uh, on their own, that they were forcibly moved out, that... Um, even though they have the same facts, they come to different conclusions about those facts. And Pape, in a sense, is a much more aggressive version of Morris. Morris is just, these are the facts, and oh, it's too bad. You know, I wish it wasn't like that. 
And Pape says, I hear the facts and this, this can't be, this has to change. And he has a very radical way of looking at things. And one of those that I really appreciated in the text is he doesn't like terms like peace process or two state solution, because those terms keep the ball rolling down indefinitely away from the Palestinians. Furthermore, if you think about it, the two state solution also is, um, um, the maximum concession from the Israelis, but it's, it's a sort of minimum concession for the Palestinians because people forget there are Palestinians from outside of Gaza. There are Palestinians from outside of the West Bank. So we've been programmed to think all Palestinians are in the West Bank and Gaza. It's the, well, there's a ton of refugees, particularly if you were south of Jaffa, you were pushed down into, into, into the Gaza area, which is now called the Gaza Strip. But there are tons of people living in Gaza who are refugees from other parts of Palestine. So uh, you, know, you go up the coast, Haifa, Acre, you... What about those Palestinians? So the idea that there's no possibility for a one-state solution, a secular democratic country, Pape is at the forefront of this, and I'm starting to hear him out. I would say that this is not something that I would have thought of before, but I keep hearing his arguments and I'm starting to understand it more. I'm not saying it's necessarily something I'm endorsing. I'm on a journey of learning this year, so I'm not, you know, offering any takes in that way, but um, that's just something something really to consider. So let's hear a little bit more from him. Hence, the peace process and talk about two states for two peoples are not in any contradiction with the occupation, not even the temporary occupation of 1967. They are a political and conceptual framework designed to enable and perpetrate the, the status quo for as long as possible. And that's true. Pape also wants us to look more closely at Zionism as a very problematic philosophy. So not just as, oh, well, you know, if there are some Jews who are Zionists, that's not such a bad thing. He really wants us to take a, a, a closer look at it. And one of the points he, he points out, <laughs> um, Zionism had one element that is usually forgotten by historians. There was a wish to secularize Jewish life. If you secularize the Jewish religion, you cannot use the Bible as a justification for occupying Palestine. And everywhere that I talk to a Jew when I was in Israel, I always heard the phrase, God gave us this land. However, there are Zionists in Israel who are not religious. He points out earlier in the text, Frank points out in, in the preview for this question, Theodore Herzl, who is known as one of the founders of Zionism, was not religious at all and did not even speak Yiddish. Right, so... We have to look a little deeper at what Zionism was and is to this day. Remember, I've said this before, there is a movement now to call anti-Zionism anti-Semitism. And we already know anti-Semitism is you know, widely applied to pretty much anything. But you cannot be opposed to the government of Israel's policies. You cannot be opposed to Zionism, which is only a branch of Judaism. It's not even Judaism. Um, it's a secular. It's a secular movement. The idea of it uh, attacking it makes you not like Jewish people, and it's just a cage that, let's say, IDF and other people who support their crazy positions want to wrap you in. You're not allowed to criticize Zionism. You're not allowed to criticize the state of Israel because that mean, that means that you hate Jewish people. Seen from the perspective of settler colonialism, the conflict is a relentless and tireless engagement with the attempt to take over as much of Palestine as possible and leave in it as few Palestinians as possible. Ironically, the wish to de-Arabize the country stemmed from a Zionist aspiration to create a European kind of democracy within the midst of the Arab world with one caveat only. It had to be a Jewish democracy. So, there are other things that people don't realize or know about Zionism. And, and again, Pape, Pape talks about this and you have to go back to the mandate uh, as I'm, I, as I've been reading, there's a book that I'll be talking about soon. Um, one Palestine complete by Tom Segev, but it goes back deeper into the history and you have to realize even the Zionists didn't have it all figured out when they, they moved, when they first got to Jerusalem after the Turks had been, uh, pushed out by the British, the, Z the first Zionists who got there, they found a total mess. And they were trying to think through how they were going to do things. So it's not as if the Jews landed with a master plan. The, the Zionist Jews had a, had a master plan, but it developed over time. 
The reason the colonialist impulse of the Zionist movement did not end at a certain historical moment lies in the territorial appetite and greediness of these settlers. When they were offered part of Palestine in 1937, they regarded it as insufficient cementing their aspirations. But they had a wise leader, David Ben-Gurion, who understood that it was tactfully beneficial not to spell out clearly these annexationist dreams. So he told the Royal Peel Commission, the Zionist movement was content with a small part of the country. And remember, we've talked before, Zeev Jabotinsky, there are a number of people who are not okay with that. They believe in not just the West Bank, but the East Bank. They want it all. And you have to go back and you have to read about this in order to, to know. Most people are not willing to do that. Again, Pape, the pathology of Zionism is crucial. When you are a historian, you always have to remember that people did not know what was going to happen. So when you look at Zionist discussions in the 1930s about Z Nazism and fascism, you have to realize that these people are talking about Nazism without knowing what, what will be the final solution. They are not appalled. They say that they should talk to these people. Quote, we have a uniformity of interest here. Unquote. They want the Jews out of Germany. We want the Jews out of Germany. On this basis, they even go into negotiations. So you can go look that up. There are Zionist negotiations with the, with the Nazi regime in order to find a way to move Jews out of Germany. On this basis, they even go into negotiations. You do not correlate Zionism with Nazism when you say that. You show that you are in the company of people, and they had to understand which interests they were serving apart from theirs. This comes to the fore very strongly. And all of the parties here, the British, the Palestinians, the French, what would later be the Syrians, the Lebanese, the, the Jordanians, um, the Germans, the ground was shifting. People were not sure what was going to happen. And so people were trying different approaches. And remember that some of the, the Jews served in the Ottoman army, and then they felt betrayed by them, and they switched their allegiance to the British. So you have to realize, too, people reserve the right to... to to make tactical choices. And I think Pape is giving Ben-Gurion that credit where credit's due is that Ben-Gurion was wise enough to look and see what is a tactical decision that makes sense for Zionism at this point. And he made the right ones. We've always, one of the things we've, we've noted and in the review that I did on the iron cage that Rashid, the professor Rashid Khalidi pointed out is the, the Jews were not lacking for strong leaders who had a vision and were able to execute it. The Palestinians were. And that's one of the most crucial parts of the story is if the Palestinians had a David Ben-Gurion equivalent, um, the story would have been, the story could have been very different. Um, and that's something that Chomsky talks about later on is that there was this missed opportunity to push out the settlers when they, when they arrived. And now you have to, you have to deal with, with what's going on. Pape also talks about BDS, which is boycott, divestion, and sanction. That's not something I have time to get to in this review, but that's a, an important point about activism. And that's one of the, I'll use that to transition to what I want to talk about with Noam Chomsky is activism has to be helpful to the people that you're trying to help, not just to yourself. Right. And so um, recently, I think there was a picture of Lord Balfour that was vandalized in England. And you have to ask yourself, okay, is that something that is going to make the protester feel good? Or will that actually help Palestinians? I, it's it's an open question, you know, because people there are tons of people who had no idea who Lord Balfour was, and I'm sure today the Google search index went up dramatically for Lord Balfour, and that will lead some people to look. But it's an open question, you know, what 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 is activism? Is it really helping the people that you want to help, or is it about you? And Chomsky uh, points out that you you shouldn't just do it for for that. So. Here's what he says. If their goals are to help the Palestinians, while they should, of course, take positions that are ethical, they also must be pragmatic. They have to ask themselves what is going to help and what is going to hurt the Palestinians. Take the anti-war movement about Vietnam, for example. There were young people who were properly outraged by the war and thought that the ethical attitude to have was to carry out acts of destruction against U.S. property, corporations, destroy armaments, and so on. That's ethical, but it was harmful. The Vietnamese were strongly opposed to it. They did not care about the fact that people in the U.S. felt good. They cared about what happened to them on the ground. And the effects on them were harmful since it provoked a huge backlash and strengthened support for the war. 
Those are the kind of choices that you always have to make when you are considering acting in the interest of someone. You have to ask what is going to help them, not what is going to make me feel good. Call it pragmatic if you'd like, but I would call it ethical. You are concerned with the effects of your actions on the people you are standing in solidarity with. I think that's a very, very important point. He also takes on the question about apartheid, because that has surfaced very much in the last 15 years in the discussion is the correlation. It was brought up by the South Africans. And remember recently, South Africans took the Israelis to court. So the South Africans have been very interested in what has been going on with Israel because they had a feel sympathy for the Palestinians because they know what they went through. And Chomsky concedes this to a point. He says that it was similar to apartheid in that the South Africans were okay with the entire world being against them if the U.S. and the U.K. stayed with them, which which is really interesting because if the U.S. did withdraw support from Israel, Israel couldn't continue what it's doing. But as long as Israel has the U.S. on its side, it can continue on. And so he says there is that similarity, that South Africa was able to hold on until the U.S. finally, under Reagan and Thatcher, finally that resistance, um, the resistance from the international community broke through to those leaders and it it worked. Um, However, there's also dissimilarities. Here's one of them. South Africa was different because the white population needed its black counterpart. It was its workforce. Israel does not want the Palestinians. And we see this recently with the 150,000 or so Palestinians that would go into Israel every day to work. Obviously, their work permits are currently canceled. They can't cross in from Gaza. And I think there's restrictions in the West Bank. So the Israelis are bringing in Indian migrant workers in order to fill those those roles of the Palestinians. And Israeli government can do what they want. They can bring in Indian migrant workers. I don't have any problem with that. But what I'm saying is, there's a sort of opportunity that the Israelis are taking to bring in workers, which can then stay in those positions, further impoverishing the Palestinians from the the few economic opportunities that they have, denying them those opportunities. So the situation becomes even worse for afterwards. By the 1990s, the apartheid regime had virtually no international support. Only two countries, the USA and Britain. They supported apartheid strongly right to the end, particularly Reagan. That was sufficient for the regime. As long as they had U.S. support, they did not care, like Israel right now. And remember that that bunker mentality then percolates down to the population. And so the the average Israeli has the attitude of, quote, the world hates us because they are all anti-Semitic, so we will do what we want. So Chomsky keeps going with this. Nothing is their fault. Everything is somebody else's fault. A lot of brutality. Remember Gideon Levy said, The excuse always is given by the Israelis that they started it. The scenes, for example, during Cast Lead, the brutal attack on Gaza with Israelis sitting on beach chairs on the hills, applauding every time a bomb fell. This is beyond obscenity. But unfortunately, it is a large part of the population. You have to think through that. And I mean, I've learned a lot in this last year. I will continue to learn this year. And the unbelievable things that have happened and continue to happen. This is just indicative of not believing that Palestinians are human beings. If you believed that the Palestinians were human beings, you would not applaud every time a bomb fell on these human beings and killed them. Where is your basic humanity? Where, where is the recognition of, of our, our shared humanity? There is none. And it can only be done if the Israeli population is convinced, as they have been, that the Palestinians are effectively animals, roaches. Remember, government officials have called the Palestinians roaches, uh, Israeli government officials, roaches in a bottle, um, a cancer that has to be uh, dealt with with chemotherapy. They talk about going into Gaza as mowing the lawn. All these, these euphemisms are meant to dehumanize the Palestinians so that they're not real people. And if they're not real people, well, yeah, you can stand up from your beach chairs and clap when a bomb falls on them. Something else that uh, Chomsky said that was interesting to me is the idea that states don't necessarily have a right to exist. Peoples have a right to exist. And that's interesting because that's one of the arguments that Israel always puts forward. Israel has a right to exist. And you say, well, but why does Israel have a right to exist? Do, Do states have a right to exist? And remember, when, you, when you're having these discussions, you have to be willing to examine your assumptions. So the assumption is Israel has a right to exist. Okay, why? 
why does Israel, and why does any state, why does France have a right to exist? Why does England have a right to exist? Right? All of these countries came into existence at some point, but there were other countries there before. Remember, for example, Wales was around, and Wales is now effectively, you could say, it's a, it's, it is still a country within this federation, but it was its own kingdom before until their royal family was murdered by the English and they were subjugated. Does, could Wales make the argument, well, Wales has a right to exist as a, as a kingdom? Things change over time. And we also have to look at the implications of this. Do, are, the, are the Israelis arguing that because they're a people that they have a right to a state? Because there are plenty of peoples that don't have a state all throughout the world. Uh, the Rohingya, um, we've talked before about the Kurds who have their peoples dispersed in Turkey, Iraq, and Syria. They didn't want that. That's just a result of their people being divided by lines that were drawn by the French and the Span and the F French and Spanish, the French and the English. That wasn't their fault. It's the same thing with the peoples who are on the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan. They didn't want to be divided. Those lines were just drawn. I'm not saying that we have to give every group of peoples who demand it a state, but we have to accept that. If you want to have a discussion about this, everything has to be on the table. And you can't just say, you know, a state has a right to exist within these borders because that means that these borders can't ever change. You have to have some flexibility if you want to deal with these difficult situations. Um, another thing along that line about borders is, that Chomsky said that was game changing for me to think about because it's back to facts, is his idea that Israel prefers expansion to security. And this is something that I said in my Israel lobby video that Israel doesn't really care if there's peace in the Middle East. They only care if they, if they have their, if they've achieved their goals and they have not yet achieved their goals. They want all of that's Israel under their total control. They don't have it yet. Once that's there, maybe they'll think about peace. But in the meantime, the job is not finished for them. And that's why I laugh when people tell me that Israel wants peace. They do not want peace. They want war. But I didn't think about it in this frame that Professor Chomsky gives. In 1971, Israel made a decision, which in my mind was its most fateful decision in its history. There was an offer from Egypt for a full peace treaty. The Israeli government, led by Golda Meir, considered it and rejected it because they wanted to colonize the Sinai. Basically, their choice at the time was between security and expansion. A peace treaty with Egypt whatever one might think about that outcome, would have meant security, in fact, permanent security, as Egypt was the only powerful Arab military force. They understood that, but they preferred to expand into the Sinai. This was a fateful decision, and it's been followed ever since. Ever since then, Israel prefers expansion over security. I mean, that's a really powerful idea, and I think it's true from, from what you can see. You can judge it by the actions of the Israeli government. Something else, uh, Israel and the United States profess to be great lovers of democracy, but they only like democracy when you give the correct answer. And we've seen this in the West as well. Uh, you know, people like democracy until Donald Trump is uh, elected. And so we don't like democracy anymore. And we like democracy until Brexit happens. And then we don't like democracy anymore. You either have, a com have to have a commitment to democracy or you have to repudiate it. But you cannot like it only when it gives you the choices that you're ideologically aligned with. And this is what happened when the Palestinians in the first free elections in the Arab world, which is apparently you would think something that the Israelis and, and Europe and the United States would be interested in, they elected Hamas. That was the wrong answer. In January 2006, Palestinians committed a major crime. They voted the wrong way in a carefully monitored free election, handing control of parliament to Hamas. The media constantly intoned that Hamas is dedicated to the destruction of Israel. In reality, Hamas leaders have repeatedly made it clear that Hamas would accept a two-state settlement in accord with the international consensus that has been blocked by the United States and Israel for 40 years. In contrast, Israel is dedicated to the destruction of Palestine, apart from some occasional meaningless words, and is implementing that commitment. I think that's a fantastic phrase, and it's one that I will be using more <laughs> if someone, someone says, tells me that Hamas is dedicated to the destruction of Israel, and I'll say Israel is dedicated to the destruction of Palestine. And I'll give credit where credit's due. It's for Professor Chomsky. So, um, 
he ends, I, well, he ends the, the first part of the book is conversations that were tape recorded and then transcribed. The second part of the book is a number of essays that go back between Chomsky and Pape. And both of them in their own way, they don't agree about everything, but I do think they have a hopeful note. And as I've, as I've said before, as I'm doing these reviews, this is something that I have to keep holding on to that no matter how terrible the things I learn are, or how hopeless things might seem, that these people have forgotten more about this conflict than I will ever possibly hope to learn. And if they still have hope in their hearts, and they still see a possibility of truth and justice triumphing, then I should have that as well, even in the natural order. Obviously, as a Christian, I have belief in truth and justice triumphing in the supernatural order. But in the natural order, sometimes uh, justice doesn't get done. But they strongly believe in it, and I, I, I found the book to be very hopeful. And I'm looking forward to going back and reading the, the prequel to this later on. As always, if you enjoyed this review, please forward it to friends who you think would benefit from this, who are open-minded. Um, as I say, strong opinions loosely held. They're willing to be persuaded to hear some different perspectives on this. Subscribe. Um, if you'd like to support the work more, you can buy a book from my Amazon wish. So you can buy this book that's linked in the description. You can join my Patreon. You can join my YouTube members, uh, group. These are ways that you can support the channel and help us get the message out to more people. Remember that a portion of the proceeds in 2024 from Patreon, from all these different things are going to be going to the Palestine children's relief fund, which has been doing great work in in Palestine for many years, but has been doing exceptional work in Gaza lately. If you follow them on social media, you'll see the documentation of the work they're doing. It's very inspiring. As always, enjoy your reading.